Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. The Broadband Bunch Zero Touch Learning Series is live. And thanks so much for joining us. I'm Craig Corbin. Today's session, Don't Go It Alone, How Partnerships Expedite Broadband Deployment. The Broadband Bunch podcasts and Zero Touch Learning Series brought to you, as always, by your Zero Touch Automation Experts, ETI Software. Be sure to follow the Broadband Bunch on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Broadband Bunch and on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash podcast bunch. You can access Broadband Bunch podcasts on Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, and iHeartRadio. A couple of quick reminders before we introduce our esteemed panel. Today's session is most definitely interactive. We encourage you to submit questions via the chat function. Our team will be monitoring that throughout the event. Session also being recorded and will be available to all attendees for future access. Please feel free to submit potential topics for future Zero Touch Learning Series sessions, or if you'd like to suggest prospective panelists. And again, you can do that via the chat function. And again, we thank you for your participation. It's my privilege to introduce our moderator for today's session, a 30-year veteran of the communications industry. Heather Gold is CEO of HBG Strategy and previously served as president and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. Following her tenure as Senior Vice President of External Affairs and Access Management for EXO Communications. She graduated magna cum laude from Tufts University with bachelor's and master's degrees in economics, earned an MBA in finance and marketing from Washington University in St. Louis, and also completed the general management program of the Harvard Business School. Our moderator, Heather Gold. Heather? Thanks, Craig. So welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. Again, as, as you know from, if you've fallen any, followed any of our previous webinars, this will be all Q&A. Um, we encourage audience participation. And so with that, I would like to launch into our topic, which is easing the pain of deployment through partnerships. While there's been a lot of talk in recent years around public-private partnerships, and these still remain critical, an increasingly popular conversation is taking place around carrier-to-carrier -carrier or carrier-to-community-based partnerships. From our panelists today, I think we'll, we'll hear that their partners appreciated their complementary assets and skills, and equally important for several, the sharing of common values and geography. Further, using partners has tended to yield better and faster results than providers and or communities could have achieved on their own. With federal funding increase, increasingly resemble the Games of Thrones, a co-carrier partnership or provider to provider provides a way for a stronger voice in both the infrastructure build out and in seeking funding options. In my home state, Virginia, our state-based telecom funding system requires communities to submit applications that contain private partners at every step of deployment, middle mile to last mile, and success has been achieved by sometimes bringing in multiple partners to cover a given county. Today, we are joined by four experts in partnerships, two who are partnering primarily with fiber buildout, one who is joining both fiber and wireless, and one who is primarily wireless. So we will cover the whole array of, of broadband deployment. Each of these panelists has had unique experience as to what takes to enable an effective partnership. Let me introduce each one briefly. Casey Logan is president and CEO of Prince George Electric Co-op, located in Prince George County in Virginia, which is southwest of Richmond and Petersburg and borders on one side by the James River. He is heading a recently announced broadband co-ops of co-ops, bringing together five electric co-ops to bring broadband to rural Virginia and Maryland. Cullen McCarthy, is the executive VP of Smithville Digital, Indiana's largest privately owned telecom. Smithville has engaged in several partnerships with neighboring electric co-ops as they seek to expand broadband in rural locations. 
Alex Hagen, the founder and CEO of the Theranet Networks, the largest fixed, brider, fixed wireless provider in California and the third largest WISP in the country, operating primarily in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he is also writing an extensive fiber backbone. Etheret has been innovative in using CBRS spectrum and just won big in the FCC recent RDOF auctions. Last but certainly not least is Amy Rodriguez, who is Vice President Sales and Marketing for Business Development for TWN Communications. Her focus there is on the development of key strategic partnerships with rural electric co cooperatives, working hand in hand with them to bring broadband services to residential and enterprise customers using both fiber and wireless solutions. So all of our companies have been in the news recently, so let's just jump in. So why don't each of you take two minutes and introduce your companies and what your recent partnership projects have entailed. And I'll start with Alex. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, we are uh, put in an interesting uh, political position. Uh, we didn't expect to become a number one uh, ISP in California in the RDOP auction. And uh, so we're trying to reach out to everybody in a way we haven't uh, before. Uh, uh, so we're learning a lot about uh, uh, partnerships and uh, the different types of hindrances and uh, what uh, facilitate them. Uh, so I'll talk about all of that uh, as time is appropriate. Uh, so that's one aspect of, uh, of the partnership search is, uh, is working together to create you know, a vibrant alternative local service provider economy for the whole country. And uh, we've always supported each other and we all have particular enemies, sort of frenemies that we, we mainly compete with, and we have people that we rely on. Uh, so uh, more will be revealed as the day goes on. Colin. Well, uh, Smithville is the, as you referenced, the largest of the, uh, the rural telecoms in Indiana. And we uh, currently serve uh, just over 20 counties throughout the state, when you include our uh, CLEC side. And we've been in the fiber of the home business since uh, 2008, early 09. Um, the two partnerships we have are uh, among the multiple uh, electric co-ops to which we are member owners. And um, one is with South Central Indiana, REMC, uh, the largest of the REMCs in Indiana. They are doing a total build out along their footprint. And in our overlapping area, we are uh, sharing that build, if you will. They're building and we are acquiring. Uh, so it's helping us get to the, the most high cost areas we have uh, within our territory. The other is with the Utilities District of Western Indiana, and that one's a little more straightforward. They are not in the broadband business, but they are uh, certainly open to discuss, and we have figured out a, an arrangement on rights of way, pole attachments, make ready fees, uh, whatever we can, to, uh, to get broadband out there in, in a cost-efficient manner, uh, mostly throughout the uh, southwestern part of our territory, uh, just southwest of Bloomington, actually. So that project started, um, I, I believe, this week, actually, and, and SEI uh, started uh, last year. Uh, we uh, announced publicly that relationship with South Central Indiana REMC the same day the state issued an executive order from the governor to quarantine. On March 16th. So, uh, <laughs> but we've been working. We've been uh, working as hard as we can, and we can't build fast enough. Uh, but um, there's where we are. So, good things. Amy. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me today, Heather. Um, so, TWN Communications, for over 25 years, we've partnered exclusively with rural electric cooperatives throughout the country to deploy communication services, primarily in the form of broadband networks, a lot of fixed wireless throughout Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Indiana. And currently, um, I would say our two profile projects right now, one is right alongside uh, Mr. McCarty there, Heartland REMC in Northeastern Indiana. We're doing a fiber build for them over the next three to five years. That one's already underway and we've already started lighting up customers. 
Um, on the other side of the country, we're working with Mojave Electric Cooperative based in Bullhead City, Arizona. That's a pretty large project. They have roughly 41,000 demand points, and that's going to be a 100% fiber to the home build. Um, as Colin mentioned, we can't build fast enough. These are these were first um, outlined as five-year projects, and I think every month that timeline shortens by the cooperative because they're seeing the hunger for broadband in everyone's eyes. So, you know, can't get equipment fast enough, can't get fiber fast enough, can't build fast enough. It's it's a pretty exciting time right now. And Casey, I'm glad to see you're back. Yeah, I apologize. We had a power blip here and it shut my router down. So it just uh, it shows how electric cooperatives and, and broadband go together. You had to have power to, to have the broadband. Um, we've been deploying fiber at Prince George Electric Cooperative since 19, excuse me, 2018. And here recently we formed the Virginia, Maryland, Delaware Association of Broadband Cooperatives. And there's five currently, there's five cooperatives currently in Virginia and Maryland who are doing broadband and we're coming together and we're finding that, you know, if we pool our resources as one, we can, we can leverage that to do better designs, uh, do better material purchases and also work with our sister cooperatives and deploying fiber on their territory. If, if that's not something they have an appetite for. So we really done some pretty neat things here in Virginia um, when it comes to broadband through the electric cooperatives. And you've partnered with other entities as well, right, Casey? That's correct. I only know because he's in my home state. <laughs> yes, we've um, we've actually partnered with Dominion Energy, um, which we believe was one of the first in the nation. Uh, we were able to access some of the Dominion Energy fiber running through Surrey County here in Virginia. And with the access to their fiber, we can then light it up and take it to the home. So not only are we serving cooperative members, uh, we're also serving Dominion Energy customers as well. Everything, you know, being within our community. So it's pretty unique setup um, and other cooperatives are going to take advantage of that with Dominion. Great. So um, let me start with um, Colin to ask him this and then we can go around the horn. What precipitated your first venture into a partnership? How would you describe the sex success or failure of that initial partnership? In other words, what led you to want to do a partnership with another entity? A number of factors. Number one, economic. <laughs> um, this was uh, an opportunity for us, uh, as I just mentioned, to build, um, if we were to partner, into areas that are extremely high cost. We've been a phone company since 1922. So we, we know how this works, but it takes a lot. And the territory we cover is pretty vast. With uh, South Central, it was a, a matter of, um, of discussion that had happened for several years and across two CEOs. Um, but we did manage to work out a, uh, I think a, a really good deal that was a mutual benefit. Because as, as SEI built out, um they saw how much capital they were going to have to spend because these were really rural areas in uh, south central indiana that they were building out to um very sparse in population by the time we get to our area they were willing to come to the arrangement that really they had proposed and that was they will they've already engineered it we can help with with certain specs and touch those up and they will build it. We will acquire it in installment payments, if you will, and just within our overlapping areas. And uh, once the customer uh, is there, uh, is connected, they have a choice between us as an ISP or SCI fiber. So either way, we will get compensation. We get compensated if, if SCI gets the uh, internet customer uh, through a, an access charge uh, that we've arranged between the two, or we get that revenue as, as the ISP. So it really did boil down to uh, a, really a good business case for both entities. So this will help them as they move westward from our territory into more AT&T territory and overbuild that network as well. So we're looking at a four year timeline and we are well within that schedule uh, despite everything that's happened, including with supply chain. And so that, that was the first one and that was really 
um, kind of a, a, a delicate dance, if you will, for a while. But uh, both their board and our ownership, I'm one of the co-owners, we're a family-owned business, it, it worked out well. You know, it's it, we look at it as working with each other in a, in a true cooperative form. As member owners and as the electric co-op, this is a great opportunity to expand broadband, and that's what we're doing. So it's a good-sized footprint that we're covering in two counties. Um, I, like I said, very rural, very small town, and it, it's just going to work out great, I think. So that's where we came to it. It was economics. Alex. Yes, well, um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, so we have some uh, some local uh, uh, ISPs that we work with, uh, Monkey Brains. They acquired Common Networks. Uh, we work with uh, uh, Cruise.io, uh, Surfnet, <laughs> Unwired. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we uh, 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 horse trade with each other. We do wholesaling. But that uh, breaking those down, those barriers and, and beginning to create this confederation. So, you know, most of the equity people want to push you towards acquisition. And the, you know, the question is, where is it appropriate to confederate, to work together? Uh, and then you develop more trust. You might be develop equity in a, a wholesale structure, and you might ma maintain your retail structures. And then ultimately, uh, one would think uh, the companies would gradually collapse in together. That way, you're not doing a hostile acquisition fundamentally. And those are the sort of questions that I have in, in talking to people. A lot of the people I'm talking to uh, want to work together, but are extremely independent minded. And um, uh, so that's a question to me is, is, is the nature of things such that without very strong horse trading, you ultimately end up with just an acquisition situation? Or uh, can you maintain this, uh, this sort of co-opetition environment? Um, and, you know, uh, uh, when things move quickly and a lot of money's involved, everything changes, right? So some of the things I can say about <clears throat> companies being able to maintain their independence and grow in this incredibly difficult environment uh, in some ways, we have an explosion of technology, we have an explosion of competition, we have Starlink, we have Amazon. So you, you, you have to have an angle. Uh, so you have to either uh, we bought some CBRS licenses, so so for some minor trading in very rural counties, so they, they weren't greatly expensive, but they helped to uh, to uh, uh, establish a conversation with people. Uh, uh, if you if you have insight to do something like that, so Spectrum can help you in creating confederations and alliances because then you're uh, you're orthogonal. You're not competing with each other exactly because you're not both on unlicensed Spectrum, and that's the main thing you want to avoid. Are multiple operators on unlicensed spectrum in the same point so then you have to sort of traffic cop it where so we, you know we would like to uh in the next year maybe uh, start developing a, a uni management system as well that's voluntary so that uh, uh we can also work on the unlicensed aspect um so uh then there's a question about the unifying principles so um what are these unifying principles uh, i mean most of us are dedicated to privacy. We, we don't see a big business model in selling our customer data, for example. Uh, we, um, uh, we have a relatively intimate relation with our customers, a customer intimacy strategy, right? Um, so, um, you know, one principle is privacy. Uh, another principle is to be dedicated to um, uh, making uh, innovation possible so that uh, people can get spectrum, can get fiber, and get the right equipment and build the right technologies and not having to be working on the most um, basic level, which it can happen in the WISP industry at times, is you just are looking for the biggest hammer you can to solve the problem. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of our own work in developing these partnerships, uh, where it makes sense to us is in eliminating overlap. And then there's a question about access control. Uh, you know, if you put uh, a fiber ring uh, around, your states and you have multiple providers that are accessing it. How do you cut those cross connects fees down? How do you have multiple access? How do you deal with uh, one of the players becoming insolvent? Uh, 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 so uh, we're you know we're sort of struggling with all of these issues right now because of the art off. It was relatively slow before, but now we have to uh, have a, a positive uh, reception from you know Humboldt County down to Monterey. 
with all the local government, all the local ISPs. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, work with the local ISPs and enable them. But what but the practice the pragmatics is, um, you know, that it's sort of, uh, what do they say, lead, follow, or get out of the way, uh, where you have to uh, meet targets, uh, 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 you have to come to some agreement with people. Um, so, you know, these are some of the issues that we're working on. What are, what are the unifying principles? Um, and I have a, a list of them, actually, but um, I've probably spoken enough for the moment. Well, we'll come back to that. And I think that probably um, some of our other uh, and, uh, individuals on this um, session can tell you what has worked for them on the overlap. Um, Amy, why don't you tell us about your first partnership and what drove that? Sure. So our very first cooperative partnership was back in 1998. We, this company began as a long distance resell play, which then evolved into dial up and then fixed wireless. And now here we are with um, fiber and fixed wireless networks. So the reason this partnership works, and it's just, I think we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. We're just doing it in slightly different ways because we have always designed and built and operated our own networks. We have that economy of scale now. So cooperatives can kind of plug into that, if you will. We do things a little differently where the, the cooperative owns the assets, TWN contributes um, a capital costs alongside, and then we stay on to operate the network because we have the call center and the construction crews and the field service technicians and billing and marketing and all of those things. So it's it's a good fit for those cooperatives who don't have the, the stomach or the resources to be able to operate a broadband network alongside their own existing electrical infrastructure. So that's kind of where we fit in. So we find great success in these partnerships. A lot of it is by the nature of the electric cooperative, access to right-of-ways, um, the knowledge of their own member base, that affinity with their members, there's nothing better than the co-op's reputation in a community. And, and that really is kind of the secret sauce, if you will. Interesting, Casey. Yeah, other, you know, the, the need or the relationship we had first built with Dominion Energy was based off of mainly uh, the need to serve our community. What we found out is we were committed to serving the Prince George Electric Cooperative members, uh, but once we got out into the communities, we found out that you know it didn't matter if you were on us or, or Dominion Energy, they wanted it too. And so we had to find a way that we could economically, you know, provide this service to Dominion Energy customers. Well, you know, Dominion Energy was able to step up to the plate. They're doing some grid modification stuff themselves. And by doing that, they're pulling fiber optic cable for their own needs. And we're able to lease that excess capacity from them in a very similar manner that we're doing today on our own cooperative system. And we're gonna be able to serve now uh, in Virginia, the entire Surrey County, um, which is about 2000 homes uh, that they serve over there. So it, it really was a need for the community and finding a solution to get it out to the communities that do not have access. I th and there are a lot of communities that are really feeling the pain right now. So um, team, are there any typical parameters with your partnerships? Is there any, have they been different? Um, Colin, you've done a couple. Amy, you've been at this a while. Alex, you say there are some impediments at times. Um, Casey, you're working with people that have a similar background to you. Are there any parameters that have come up that tend to um, make it work easier? And whoever wants to can go first here. Well, um, uh, what I've found, um, the, the, one of the issues I have is I can't actually divulge many of the partnerships you're working on because um, those press releases haven't come out yet. They're still confidential. So I can only speak uh, generally. Um, but uh, uh, the, the questions that I have in constructing these is, uh, uh, is the, uh, first of all, uh, we're talking about wholesale cooperatives, mainly dealing with the power grid and, and relating that to being able to distribute fiber. Now, getting into a wholesale cooperative for wireless ISPs, that's a whole nother kettle of fish and it hasn't really happened yet, okay? Um, so 
can we provide spectral resources to operators? Can we uh, acquire spectrum? Uh, can we create a fiber backbone? Is there a way to provide access? Who gets involved? What is a wholesale backend entity? Do we help provide uh, something like a, a front end co-op, the ESOP? Um, so, I mean, I'm still in the, uh, I've got to admit in the question phase, we have, I mean, we acquired the largest tower in the Bay Area through effectively a, a partnership type of model. We went to our clients and crowdsourced uh, of that and uh, ended up with a couple of key partners in the tower business. Uh, we do some revenue sharing with uh, local providers, but we're looking at uh, being able to get the uh, the growth rates uh, of our industry at a you know stronger level. And uh, uh, you know we we want a vibrant sort of fifth estate to allow more innovation. We we see sort of a you know the five G technologies could be extremely empowering for service providers. Okay. So and what about that. what about you? As far as the typical parameters, yeah. yeah. We try to, you know, every co-op is the same, but every co-op is extremely different. So, you know, we operate under the same construct, if you will, where it's it's a revenue share, we're equally invested, things along that line. But, you know, there are different needs, there are different densities different populations. So, you know, we, we operate under that that joint marketing, joint build model. That's what I would say is our typical parameter, but there's little idiosyncrasies within each one. But agreements where both parties have a little bit of risk and a little bit of win seem to always be the most beneficial. Everyone's invested, everyone's real excited because it's it's a, these are huge projects and it's a lot of money on the table. So everyone's highly engaged and um, we found that to just be very successful a lot of transparency yeah and Colin you've partnered with two co-ops have you ever is that sort of the secret sauce with your expansion effort yeah, there, yeah the the partnership we have with UDWI is uh, what we had in mind all along and that is um, infrastructure but with that there is um, it's not a revenue share but there are price breaks they will um, amortize certain things so over a longer period of time along their their owned infrastructure and in return we will uh, give the members a, a price break and actually uh, um, the corporate office if, if we were to take on the corporate office that would um, that enterprise circuit would probably receive a, uh, a cost break as well so they're helping us with marketing there's a lot of give and take here and everybody has a, a mutual interest in getting things done. Uh, UDWI is busy rebuilding its plant and rebuilding its reputation, but they're doing a great job right now and their focus is on power. So they're very happy to work with us on broadband, but that's where the give and take comes in. You know, we offer this on infrastructure, would you offer this on, on pricing and services and so forth? Absolutely. You know, again, we're we're also a member owner and we want to get as much broadband as we can uh, out there to our uh, quote unquote legacy phone company footprint, which is quite large um, along that stretch. So it, it's worked out extremely well, uh, but that's what we've been looking at all along is that that joint um, relationship where the give and take is just a, a given uh, that we can um, go to each other with complete trust and, and transparency and say you know we need to change this in the project or you know this we've run into the limestone capital right now so we've run into a lot of rock okay you know we're going to have to figure something out here so that kind of thing we plan for that there's a lot of flexibility as well as transparency there interesting now Casey, you're partnering with other co-ops. Do you plan to have somebody build and somebody else service it, or is this primarily a buying consortium? No, it, it's a, a sharing consortium as well. Um, we have a partnership going on right now in Virginia where one cooperative is going to build the infrastructure. However, they do not want to take the ownership of being an ISP, so they're going to uh, partner with another cooperative who's already 
you know, been an ISP for a couple of years now, and that cooperative is going to serve their membership. So um, it, it's pretty unique, kind of similar to some of the other partnerships we, we have uh, covered already here today. And one thing I want to add with, with getting these things underway, uh, these partnerships take time. Uh, it, it was over a six month process, a lot of transparency, a lot of open communication when dealing with other people because you're not only are you sharing uh, information uh, possibly about member data, you're sharing infrastructure information, uh, you know, that, that's the main part as well as, you know, the revenue sharing side of it. So these partnerships take time. Uh, you know, ours have been six months plus in the works that, that we have had to go through to, to just get started with them. Have any of you had partnerships that failed that you're willing to, well, you don't have to tell me the name of the company, but I see Amy laughing. I bet you've had one that one or two. No, actually <laughs> we haven't. I mean, we, we construct things in such a way that it, it would be, I mean, there'd have to be severe natural disasters for, for it to really fail, but we've been lucky so far. And Alex, have you had any partnerships that failed? You're on mute, Alex. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had partner. No, we've had partnerships that we developed at a certain point and then shut down, right? So we ended up no going things, but we never actually assigned the dotted line on a, a partnership that we ended up regretting, uh, something uh, legally binding, um, managed uh, to avoid litigation in our 17 years. So. Okay, that's that's pretty good. That's a pretty good recommendation to entities sitting out there wondering if they should go into a partnership, I would think. Um, how, how do you guys go about funding these partnerships? Is that, does that become a sticky wicket at all? Um, Amy, you want to take that one first? Um, sure. So it's a combination of a lot of things. So most of the cooperatives that are entering into this that we're working with, they're getting funding from the likes of a CoBank or, or a CFC, and then along with maybe just some existing funds within the cooperative. And then we marry that up with the, the capital that we invest alongside. So it really, it, you know, it can take a hundred million dollar project down to a $75 million project from their perspective. So, you know, it makes it a little more palatable for the board, especially, but it, it that's pretty much how we go about the funding. Of course, there's all the federal programs that, some are lucky enough to be winners in the lottery and some aren't, but you know, we'll keep trying. And and Colin, how are you guys doing it? Well, with uh, with South Central, what we're doing is um, in doing installment payments, we are rolling that project into what would be a typical capital budget. So whatever we would allot, um, that's, you know, we would fund it anyway. So, their build is being funded by us <laughs> in that overlap. Uh, initially, they did uh, have a, an RUS loan uh, for their project, but in this overlap, it's it's really coming from us uh, as they're the um, contracted builder, so to speak. So we just look at it as as an expedited area within our our capital budget plan. Okay, so you're doing internal funding on it. Internal funding, and the same with UDWI. It's just, you know, uh, helping to shave off the costs there. Okay. Casey, how are you guys funding your um, co-op of co-op builds? Yeah, we're taking advantage of, you know, the federal funding that has been out there from the CAF2 auction, as well as the art off. And in Virginia, the local municipalities and the county governments have really stepped up and offered funding uh, to cooperatives and other entities wanting to build fiber out in their communities. Uh, also in Virginia, we have what's called our VADI, the Virginia uh, Telecom Initiative that Governor Northam, uh, for let's say instance for 2021, has put in the budget, you know, for $50 million to help expedite uh, the construction of these projects. So we've been really fortunate when it comes to funding opportunities. It, it's just getting the materials, the manpower, and getting everything together and getting it deployed. Uh, we're like everybody else. We want to move as fast as we can. And Alex, what are you guys using for your funding? Uh, we well, we have uh, some equity investor partners, and it also depends on um, 
Uh, the horse trading aspect, we have a lot of assets, uh, which is uh, spectrum licenses, uh, uh, fiber. So uh, it's part of it uh, when we're uh, funding a new initiatives. Obviously, we have the uh, you know this RDOF grant as well for for driving it. So it's a combination of private capital um, and um, valuation of each other's stri strategic assets to figure out how to um, how to revenue share potentially. Interesting. Um, so in working with the communities, uh, I know Smithville is in a is heavily invested in its communities in Indiana and the companies it's working with. What kind of role does the do you expect your communities to play in these build outs? Have they been active in in demand aggregation, for example, or have you anticipated any kind of role for them? I think the only true aspect in that regard with the community is um, through our county government. And that was um, part of the legislation enacted by the Indiana General Assembly a few years ago, where these new fiber builds um, in underserved and unserved areas, especially unserved areas, could be declared as, uh, as part of a, um, not a TIF, but um, an infrastructure development zone. I had to think about it. Infrastructure development zone, an IDZ, that can be uh, named by the county fiscal body, which is here at county council. So a county council can uh, receive an application for that and they can um, award a, a five year tax abatement on that fiber investment. It has to be fiber um, uh, by state legislation. So that's really the only community piece um, that's out there for us. And, and you know we're going to take advantage of that but uh, we'll see how, how it goes. I mean, we, we're just now in the construction phase. I, I failed to mention, we did receive a grant for a small portion of um, in, in the area just north of us, actually, uh, from the state of Indiana, Next Level Connections grant uh, that the state um, awarded us a couple of years ago, and that work is underway. So we have a, a number of, of tools in the box, uh, but the county council with the IDC, that's a, a nice one. You know, it's not it's not spectacular, it's not sexy, but it's you know we can take that for a few years. We can do an amazing. Good. And Amy, are you guys using um, any kind of community engagement in your build outs? Very similar um, to what was just mentioned as far as tax abatements and things like that. It's interesting in Indiana because the cooperatives don't provide electricity to these cities, just the surrounding areas. But it turns out the cities are really excited about fiber coming their way. Mm -hmm. So um, they're they're working hard to to sweeten the deal for so everyone wins. I mean, they they definitely want us to build into these communities as well, and I think that's the path it's going to take. So um, we have found communities very receptive and willing to help in any way that they can. And how about you, Alex? Have you asked your communities to step up and help with the deployments at all? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we've had very uh, you know positive. Uh, results working with uh, Humboldt County. I would definitely give a shout out to the people that I dealt with up there, um, Amanda Sino. We've been working with the Monterey Central Coast Broadband Consortium. These are, um, some of these are, uh, are sort of voluntary associations and some of them have funding mandates from the Public Utilities Commission. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the key issue has been, what do we do with the local provider who might, who, uh, uh, how do we, incorporate them in or or do we just build over them as they say uh, and then uh, the other uh, important issue in working with these consortium is uh, what is the network going to look like and then there's the issue about all the related stuff so you guys are talking about energy a lot uh, so here in California we have a lot of issues with a uh, fire <laughs> and uh, and so do we uh, do telemetry for the BLM and for the uh, Cal Fire uh, uh, so you know, we, we will be able to uh, lay out this network much more efficiently, quickly if we can integrate it in the firefighting structures in some areas, because the lookouts are ideal points for us to create a licensed uh, uh, backhaul, and they need they don't have connectivity. So uh, lots of interesting things. But yeah, we've had very positive. But the, the one problematic aspect, one is what do you do? with the competition, whoever, somebody will naturally become your adversary in situations. 
And then how do you uh, glad hand them? How do you get them on your side? Uh, because your goal is not to destroy them. Your goal is to do something else, right? Uh, then the uh, you know the other question is about uh, the politics of the build. Uh, a lot of people want fiber, uh, uh, but fiber is probably uh, uh, create a lot of carbon footprint. Uh, so I want to analyze carbon footprints for the different technologies uh, as well. Uh, you know, some rural people in the heartlands maybe are buying a climate, but <laughs> I have a you know a climate feed every day, scientific climate feed. I mean, things are absolutely horrific that in the next 20, 30 years if we don't. But the good news is once the temperature of this planet starts dropping, all this goes away. I mean, we can easily restore a whole planet once we get to a carbon neutrality. So uh, those are you know those are important issues here in California. I mean, we are having climate change means that that your lowest temperature may end up being uh, in the, uh, I mean, your highest temperature may have be in the future, your lowest temperature, you can have entire systems shift. So your birds, everything is gonna be different. So these are also issues is how do we future proof uh, with our communications and our energy systems. Yeah, that's a challenge for you guys. Um, Casey, how have your communities been engaged? <laughs> Well, you know, we wouldn't have been able to even start our project without um, our local government in Prince George County. They gave us a million dollar inducement grant to really to allow us to get off the ground. Uh, in Virginia, we're regulated by our state corporation commission. So a, a electric cooperative can't just go out and build fiber. We had to start a subsidiary. We had to fund that subsidiary and Prince George County allowed us to do that so we rely heavily on our local governments not only for the funding aspect but also engaging the community uh, building the networks is one thing but getting out and educating the community about the the offers that fiber to the home can give them high-speed internet availability whether it's telemedicine uh, pandemic now everybody's understanding you know what broadband means to do homeschooling and, and, and work from home so things like that, we depend very heavily on our local communities and engage them uh, monthly with progress reports and also with community, you know, Facebook postings or meetings themselves. So it is a big reliability for us. Oh, that's great. Um, I wanted to reach out and ask you guys what your most creative partnership ever was. Um, what, is, what did you put together that was really different? and um, what made it both interesting and successful. And I'm gonna start with Amy, because I think she's been doing this a little longer than the rest of us. Well, I, I wouldn't say it was the most creative partnership, but part of one of these builds I find very creative, and that's um, there's an actual gold mine that's sitting outside of, seven miles outside of town, and the co-op ran seven miles of line electric line up there and they want visibility into generators and, and things like that so we're going to be running seven miles of fiber up this mountainside so this gold mine can you know get their data readings and all of that thing all of that sort of thing so i mean things like that over and over again i think the creativity comes in the solutions that we're building for a lot of these members these cooperative members and it's it's different every day and it's it's fun yeah yeah that sounds neat Casey. You know, I'm, I'm gonna go back to kind of the public-private partnership we did with Prince George County. Um, you know, Prince George County was able to get recognized nationally for, for doing that. I, I'm gonna think it maybe was one of the first public-private partnerships in America that really focused on deploying broadband uh, in a community. So that's really was, was kind of the first of its kind. I know definitely in Virginia and it helped kick us off and get us off the ground. So. Uh, that was pretty neat for us to, to get going in that kind of way. Yeah. Um, Colin, what's the most interesting um, or, yeah, entertaining um, fact you've run into with your partnerships yet that have really required creativity? Too soon to tell. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it really is. You know, we, uh, uh, we have a, a pretty good uh, general assembly they got on top of the the right-of-way issue with with the co-ops uh, up front given the legal problems that were being had over 
electric versus broadband right of way. So that issue was cleared. Um, we, in the fiber project itself, just us as a company, I think the biggest issue is railroads. And I, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has a solution for that one, but we did run into an instance where we had received verbal permission to cross a railroad during our, our project a, a decade ago in, uh, in an area west of Indianapolis. It's in a small exchange. And so as the contractor was out there getting ready to go, apparently the ink wasn't dry yet because the U.S. Marshals did show up fully armed. Um, <laughs> so we- That's creative. That's creative. That's a good word story, yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, we we take these lessons. We build a knowledge base on, on our current project. And if we run into any of those situations with either of these relationships, either with South Central or with our, uh, with UDWI, you know, we know what to do. Uh, we'll know what to look for. So fingers crossed. Uh, these are still uh, uh, projects that are being hatched, uh, especially with UDWI. But um, I don't think we'll have any major issues and you know knock on wood um, so we will and see uh, yeah wow and alex have you had any more interesting experiences in your with your partners well i think the most creative uh undertaking we were involved with was when the mount madonna ksbw tower was slated for demolition because the television station moved their transmitter i think hearst corporation bought them so this tower had no function anymore. It, it was there as 1400 foot tall tower. Uh, and uh, we had spent years uh, putting uh, fixed wireless at 800 to 900 feet up this tower. Uh, so uh, uh, we organized our clients. Uh, some of our, we sent a letter out to clients and say, hey, we need money to buy this tower. And we created the Mount Madonna Tower Owners Association. Um, and uh, now we're finally buying them out, but they got a nice tax write-off and we're buying them out at, you know, we're basically saying, let's take five and a half percent from day one. Um, and uh, so you get this tax write-off and then you get a good return. So it was a happy story at the end. There were some eccentric people who agreed to invest. So it was interesting managing everyone, you know. Um, I mean, they were lovely people, but just just people out of the woodwork that show up and say, yes, I'll, I'll put, and then you find out later, uh, you know what sort of partners you have but there was no problem uh, uh there was there were, actually that's not true i mean the key investor wanted to get out you know uh, so uh but he's happy uh, <laughs> but there was a period of time where he was saying hey alex i've been in this thing down for 10 years when are you gonna get me out so now he's out so uh, i don't know if that's a good enough story to tell you guys but i think it's a good story i think that's interesting um guys do you ever run into any competitive or regulatory barriers um, i know casey was talking about how important it is in virginia to keep your local uh, governments happy and i do that i know that's true that they're considered key but are there other competitive or regulatory challenges are you all working in such remote areas that you know the cable codes aren't you're not on their horizon to aggravate no, uh, Heather, I can tell you in Virginia, uh, we had a lot of challenges um, that when we apply for VADI or the state of Virginia funding, a lot of the IOUs on the telecom sides, the cable providers and phone providers will challenge a lot of our applications. And by challenge, I mean, basically, they will claim that they served. Um, everybody on this call understands that uh, the maps that the United States have for coverage are, are not very good. Um, Virginia doesn't have a very good system internally themselves. Mm -hmm. So we get challenged a lot from competitors, even though um, they're not in the area, um, they'll claim that they are um, going um, for a broadband minimum now from 10.1 to 25.3 has cleaned some of that up. But we, we still face that a lot from uh, some of the larger entities of, of trying to really just place a barrier to entry force. Yeah, I I can hear you. Anybody else having regulatory or competitive barriers? Well, I mean, what uh, Casey mentioned is an interesting aspect of this sort of uh, managed competition uh, with the you know federal and state funding, uh, which is that uh, 
you're assigned areas and they're non-conflicting, but as soon as the technology is considered long in the tooth, all the territories are reopened for. So this is a gift that will keep on giving, but if people aren't vigilant, the gift will go to their competitors. Um, so it's an interesting system of uh, managed competition. Um, so, I mean, right now the, the, the RDOF went at 1,000 down, 500 up, you know, that was, if you went into bid at 100 down and 25 up, um, you wouldn't have gotten very much assignment because um, people were bidding at the gigabit level. So this, uh, and these, I'm just wondering, are we gonna end up at someday needing 100,000 down and 50,000 megabits up? I mean, how much uh, bandwidth uh, can um, a household use? Uh, but so far, uh, you know, the technology comes out to use the bandwidth that's available. So I presume if you have enough money, if you had a 100 gig connection, there would be computers you could do something with that. Yep. Colin or Amy, have you had any regulatory competitive challenges? No. No. We're, yeah, we're in our, and, and these projects were in our existing footprint, and um, there have not been, and, and we're not going to get much competition. In, in the hills and hollers of, of southern Indiana, except maybe from wireless, but um, that's that's spotty. You know, that, that I had colleagues who were in that business just southeast of us, and they've they since sold, but that's a hard reach. It's a hard ask. So competition, no regulatory, no. Okay, Amy, same, same. I mean, and even specifically in Arizona, which this particular area is Sudden Link and Frontierland, and they can't pack their bags fast enough to get out of there. They're basically like laying out a red carpet. So it's a good problem for us, bad for the customer, but it will be good. We have a couple of questions coming in, so I'm gonna ask them. Okay, the first one is somebody from Flash Telecoms Limited London wants to know if any of you are interested in, in a hybrid fiber wireless network partnership in West Africa, have any of you considered going international? Yes. Oh. Yes. So we will make sure, Alex, that you get um, Babs. If you can um, let Mary, uh, the moderator, know what your email is, we'll have Alex reach out to you on that. And then the next question is for Amy. And we want, everyone wants to know, did you charge the customer for the seven mile build up the mountain? And, um, or did you and the electric co-op split the cost? It's actually still in the, I'm sorry, go ahead and finish, I'm sorry. They said their running cost per mile is in excess of 70, 70 K per mile in their rural area. So they were Our, a little. Yeah, ours is not that high, I'm glad to say. And I don't, maybe it's just, because of our scale, um, but it, it will be. Is it aerial it, or underground? It will be mostly aerial, very, very little underground. Um, and the electric lines were just run, they're brand new right up the side of the mountain aerial. So there'll be a little section of underground. Um, so that probably is the, the cost differentiator, but it will be a, mm -hmm. a joint collaboration of costs likely between the co-op and us to get that done because there's some infrastructure it's it's part of it is for co-op infrastructure so they can be into that site okay um now i know that um this is an interesting question because it goes back to the competition issue it says that for many co-ops it seems like the big companies like spectrum and comcast keep encroaching into their areas and as cities expand outward, and how do you handle that? Have you seen that at all in any of your areas, Casey, Colin, Alex? No, not not really. Um, mainly because we, you know, our territory, quite frankly, does not have a you know high growth rate as far as population. Um, the larger telecoms have already went where they wanted to go. Um, kind of serving the, the municipalities more or less, just the, the towns that are in the area. So no, we, we don't, and, and we feel like once we take fiber to an area, 
um, we will have a pretty good, you know, competitive advantage over somebody wanting to bring a, you know, a coaxial or, or any other type of medium to, to try to come into that area and serve. Colin, have you right. seen? Oh. oh, I was just going to mention, um, if, you know, if, if an operator uh, can mature their, their, their practice sufficiently, uh, most uh, municipalities and local government are going to tend to prefer um, the you know the uh, the local uh, company over uh, the 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 monopolies, uh, uh, but that's not a given, and they're not comfortable with risk. Government they don't like risk, so obviously unlicensed wireless is not something that they go to sleep at night uh, uh, soundly on. So uh, you, I think we can easily um, have a stronger relationship with government than the monopolies, but you have to have your uh, a very a reputable established practice in order to be able to do that. Okay. Or develop. Yeah. We haven't seen that um, where we are. Uh, we are surrounded by spectrum commitments. But I don't I don't know if we'll have that. Okay. Okay. Oh, I mean, okay. we, we, oh, okay. we, we, I mean, we've seen, a, 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 you know, incredible abandonment of uh, counties uh, by uh, uh, the larger providers. I mean, just a lot of horror stories. So it, I think uh, the, another question that operators have to ask is, how are they going to align themselves with community um, networks? You know, are you going to end up, uh, because these will grow, there will be communities that build their own fiber and somebody's got to operate it. Um, so. Uh, if you can align yourselves towards some of these uh, public-private, you know, initiatives, that can be helpful too. Okay. Okay. So the last so the thing, last thing about echo, 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 what advice? What? I want to wrap up by asking, what advice would you give to companies that are both looking for strategic partners, but also thinking about becoming a strategic partner? And I'll have Amos. And I'll have Amos. So the first part of the question, I, I would say for companies looking for a strategic partner, it, it's like shopping for a good pair of blue jeans. You, it, this is a long-term relationship. It's almost like a marriage and you better, I mean, anybody can build a fiber network. I say that kind of half serious, but I mean, there are a lot of companies that can do this. There are a lot of companies that can operate, but you, you better really feel comfortable with the people that you're you're sharing this project with. And that is probably the biggest piece of advice I can give. And as far as someone looking into doing this, yes, competing against you. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a big undertaking. I mean, all of us sitting here, have, I'm sure had a lot of heartburn and sleepless nights trying to get this done. This is, I mean, if it were easy, everybody would have done it already. AT&T would have done it, Verizon would have done it, and they have it, and there's a reason for it. And it, this is a, a very brave and strong group of individuals that take this on. Thanks. Anybody else want to answer that question? Yeah, just echo a little bit of what Amy said. As a telco, yes, because these partnerships um, are going to help immensely. And you have to you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to give? You know, just like a, a kind of long-term relationship. And exactly why we partner is because it isn't easy. It's very difficult, as our one of our partners has found out. And that's one reason why it really has worked. So you just have to be committed to it. You've got to look at that long view, like our business does and like the co-ops do. And uh, whatever is best for the community, for both entities, you know, you just have to expect that. Good. And Alex or Casey, did you want to weigh in on that? No, just under, right. understand your expectations. It, this is not a, a fast turnaround. Everybody wants to think that it, it can be a quick money maker for you, but uh, but it's not. Um, it is a a big payback. Uh, there, Amy said it best. There's a reason the other the other guys aren't doing it. Uh, so we, you got to do it for the right reasons and have the right expectations going into it. All right. And with that, I want to thank you all, and I'll turn it over to Craig. What a great event, and uh, thank everyone for taking part.
in this. We greatly enjoyed the conversation. It's always good to have some fun toward the end of, uh, of the webinar too. We uh, potentially have set up another partnership there with Alex and the gentleman in, the, in West Africa. So a uh, success all the way around. On behalf of everyone here with the uh, Broadband Bunch Zero Touch Landing Series, we thank you so much. Be sure to look forward to our future events. We'll see you next time right here on the Broadband Bunch Zero Touch Learning Series. So long, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank nice to meet you, folks. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.